Hello, I'm back with the second and hopefully final part of this makeup video for the hurricane closure on October 6th. Um, this entire makeup is based upon the documentary called Bananas, which I've um, sent you hopefully a link to, and you could also um, rent or stream if you have the right um, stuff. So first watch the movie and that will hopefully make you interested in the rest of this. In fact, I feel pretty confident it will. And you should watch part one of this makeup before you watch this part. And then there's a very recent case out of the Third Circuit, which uh, traces a lot of the history of this uh, bunch of litigation. And um, that's the Chavez case. So I'm asking you to read that. And then if you're interested in hearing some of the aftermath of the case that was featured in the movie Bananas, uh, you should read the Laguna case, although that is uh, optional. So um, at the end of the last video, we had um, just seen that 16,000 plaintiffs who were in front of the court in Texas um, had had their case dismissed for forum nonconvenience and were sent back to their home courts in Central and South America. Meanwhile, some plaintiffs attempted to file a different lawsuit in Hawaii, of all places, um, and that was done in 1997 uh, in Hawaii State Court, and it was known as Patrickson versus Dole. Now, the six named plaintiffs in the Patrickson case were putative unnamed class members in the Delgado case, the Texas case, uh, which becomes important when we consider the uh, statute of limitations ramifications. So um, this was also a putative class action. At some point, the plaintiffs stopped trying to make these class actions because uh, they weren't having much success in getting the classes certified. And you can imagine why that is based on uh, the predominance of, um, it, it, it's likely, I haven't read the opinions, I think they're unpublished, but it's likely that the uh, individual issues uh, predominated over the common questions rather than vice versa. Um, but at this point, the plaintiffs were still trying to bring class actions, so this was also a putative class action. And once again, uh, Dole brought in these third-party defendants who were allegedly partially owned by the Israeli government. Therefore, um, Dole uh, claimed that there would be federal jurisdiction under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and removed the case to federal court on that basis. However, in um, a series of opinions, the Ninth Circuit and ultimately the Supreme Court held that removal under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act here was not proper. Um, so this is from the uh, Supreme Court case, uh, which held that a corporation is an instrumentality of a foreign state under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act only if the foreign state itself owns a majority of the corporation's shares. So Israel only owned shares of the parent company, not the subsidiary companies, which were the ones that were impleted and became the third party defendants in the Patrickson case. These are um, manufacturers of that pesticide, by the way. In addition, um, nobody, none of the companies had a relationship with Israel by the time the suit was filed. And so the court held that you needed to look at the relationship between the, corp the corporation and the foreign country at the time the suit was filed, not at the time the uh, events occurred in the lawsuit. So it's another example of, you know, the typical rule that we've seen in jurisdictional statutes, which is that you look to see if diversity exists, for example, at the time the complaint is filed. So, um, in other words, it wasn't properly removed to federal court. And so, uh, Patrickson was then remanded to Hawaii State Court. The plaintiffs moved for class certification and that was denied. So the named plaintiffs continued on their own. 
in their six individual capacities. And Dow then filed a motion for summary judgment, arguing that their claims were barred by Hawaii's two-year statute of limitations. So that gets us into these rules on uh, the operation of the statute of limitations in class actions. So the general rule, which was set forth in the two Supreme Court cases you see at the bottom of the screen, American Pipe and Crown Cork and Seal, um, the general rule is that the pendency of a class action will toll, in other words, stop, the statute of limitations for all members of the putative class, even the unnamed members, until class certification is denied. At that point, when class certification is denied, class members may choose to file their own suits or to intervene as plaintiffs in the pending action. So the thing about the um, those Supreme Court cases is that they didn't explicitly consider this idea of cross-jurisdictional tolling. Meaning, well, what if the original class action is filed in one state? Um, and yes, it, the statute of limitations is told as to all the putative class members for bringing an action in that state, but is it told in other states? So that's what cross-jurisdictional tolling means. So the Hawaii Supreme, uh, sorry, the, the Hawaii State Court in the Patrickson case had to determine whether it would extend the general tolling rule to cross-jurisdictional tolling. In other words, whether the pendency of a class action in Texas, the Delgado case, tolls the statute of limitations in Hawaii, the uh, Patterson case. And the Hawaii court held that it did. And so uh, it said, and I'm sorry that some of this is cut off uh, the screen, but uh, cross-jurisdictional tolling ends when a court in the other jurisdiction, here that would be Texas, issues an order expressly denying a motion for class certification, or when a court in the other jurisdiction, again, this would be Texas in this case, enters final judgment dismissing the class action, or when a class member opts out of the class. So applying those rules to the facts of this case, the court held that the complaint in Hawaii was timely filed because the Texas District Court dismissed the Carcamo um, Delgado class action by final judgment entered on October 27, 1995. Uh, that would be the judgment of um, form, uh, dismissal for form nonconvenience. Hawaii's two-year limitation period then restarted uh, at the time of the dismissal in Texas. So that would mean that the plaintiffs were required to file their complaint by October 27, 1997, and they filed their complaint on October 3, 1997, and so the complaint was timely filed. So back in Texas, um, some time went by, and by the early 2000s, it had become clear that these foreign courts were, as the Texas District Court had anticipated, unwilling to hear these cases. So they had been sent back to the plaintiff's home countries only to have the plaintiff's home country courts refuse to hear the cases. And so the plaintiffs returned to Texas and asked for permission to litigate their claims in the United States. And the, the Texas District Court, acting under the return jurisdiction clause that it had included in its 1995 dismissal order, revived the case and sent it back to Texas State Court. Uh, so you remember that happened in the last video. Um, in, in dismissing for form nonconvenience, 
the court had reserved the right to um, reassume jurisdiction if the plaintiff's home country courts would not accept jurisdiction. So that's what happened after, you know, five, six years went by. Um, plaintiffs moved for class certification, but the court denied it. So again, uh, the plaintiffs decided to sue in individual actions in either Louisiana, where Standard Fruit was now located, remember Standard Fruit was one of the main defendants, or Delaware, where a number of the defendants were headquartered. So they weren't quite sure which of those two states to sue in, and they were concerned at at this point in time about statute of limitations problems, because this has all happened, remember, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so they, they filed first in federal court in Louisiana uh, in a case known as the Chaveri lawsuit. And of course, the defendants immediately moved for summary judgment on the grounds that it was uh, untimely under the statute of limitations. So fearing that that case would be dismissed, the plaintiffs, um, while that motion in uh, Louisiana was pending, the plaintiffs filed another action in Delaware, which is known as the Chavez case. So what we have here is an example of something that happens uh, quite frequently in complex litigation. We have duplicative lawsuits or competing lawsuits, um, you know, lawsuits that are between the same parties pending in different courts. And in a case like that, um, courts usually file, uh, follow something called the first filed rule, which, you know, all other things being equal, they tend to let the first filed action go forward and stay the second filed action, although that rule is subject to a lot of qualifications. So Dole uh, in Delaware moved to dismiss the Delaware lawsuit under the first filed rule because the Louisiana action was the first filed. And so this is um, a basis for the court to decline to exercise its jurisdiction. So it's really a doctrine of abstention, not, you know, the, the court has jurisdiction, it's just declining to exercise it. And the first filed rule is grounded on equitable principles. So you can argue, you know, various factors on why, you know, the first filed rule shouldn't be followed. Um, but if the court does decide to uh, go with the first filed action, then the court in the second filed action has a choice to make what to do with the second filed action. So it can either stay that action, just, you know, let it sit on the docket, but it's stayed, nothing happens in it. It can transfer it to another court, or it can dismiss it. And if it dismissed it, it can, it can do that either without prejudice, or it can dismiss it with prejudice, permanently terminating the case. The Delaware District Court chose the most severe of those four options. It dismissed the case with prejudice. So uh, this case went up on appeal to the Third Circuit, and the Third Circuit examined treatises and other cases that were similar and said that, you know, these sources indicate that in most circumstances, a stay or a transfer of the second filed action will be more appropriate than a dismissal. Um, it's, you know, you can stay the action, let that first action go forward, but it's better than dismissing it. So one factor to look at in deciding whether to stay or to dismiss is, well, if you dismiss it, are you going to create statute of limitations problems for the plaintiffs? Is the statute of limitations going to run if you dismiss the case? And here, of course, it would have. So the Third Circuit held that the trial court abused its discretion in dismissing with prejudice the Delaware action. 
and it said, in the vast majority of cases, a court exercising its discretion under the first filed rule should stay or transfer a second filed suit. Even a dismissal without prejudice may create unanticipated problems. A dismissal with prejudice will almost always be an abuse of discretion. So the second issue in this Chavez case, which was now up on the Third Circuit, and like I said, just was recently decided last month. So that's, that's how long this litigation has been going on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there was a second issue, which was that one of the uh, defendants, Chiquita Bananas, had moved to dismiss in Delaware because of a lack of personal jurisdiction over Chiquita in Delaware. And um, the Third Circuit agreed that Delaware did not have general jurisdiction um, over Chiquita, but it reversed the dismissal, holding that the Delaware District Court had a statutory obligation to transfer the claims against that defendant to another district court where personal jurisdiction would be present. So to go over the reasoning of that a little bit, um, remember the distinction in the personal jurisdiction doctrine between uh, specific jurisdiction, where the defendant's contacts with the form state give rise to the plaintiff's cause of action, and general jurisdiction, where the defendant feels essentially at home in the form state such that it is not unfair to subject the defendant to a suit there on a cause of action unrelated to the context with the form state. So looking first at specific jurisdiction, there were admittedly no events concerning the defendant in Delaware that related to the plaintiff's claim. So uh, the plaintiffs conceded there was no specific jurisdiction over Chiquita in Delaware. Under general jurisdiction, uh, hopefully you recall from civil procedure that the latest case out of the Supreme Court on general jurisdiction is Daimler versus Bauman, um, which held that um, a, a, there is general jurisdiction over a corporation in a state where it feels essentially at home and the paradigm examples of being essentially at home for a corporation are the state in which it is incorporated and the state where it has its headquarters or principal place of business, um, neither of which uh, were true for Chiquita in Delaware. So the Third Circuit agreed that under the Daimler case, Chiquita was never at home in Delaware it wasn't incorporated there, it didn't maintain an office there, and it didn't supervise its business there, or make any high-level decisions there. So the court agreed there's no personal jurisdiction over Chiquita in Delaware for this case. But Chiquita is incorporated in New Jersey. So the plaintiffs asked that the matter be transferred there rather than dismissed right outright. So, more review from civil procedure. Um, you may recall the statutes on transferring a case in federal court where venue or personal jurisdiction is not correct in the originally filed court. Um, we have 1406 and 1631, and both of them uh, provide similarly that um, if a district court concludes that a plaintiff has sued in the wrong division or district, the district court shall dismiss or, if it be in the interest of justice, transfer the case to any district or division in which it could have been brought. So recalling that the federal court system is one unitary system and federal district courts can transfer cases 
from one to another, um, it, rather than dismiss a case that's filed in the wrong venue or where it doesn't have personal jurisdiction, a federal district court can simply transfer it to a correct court and thus spare the plaintiff from being dismissed and possibly having the statute of limitations run and having to pay the refiling fee, etc. So um, the Third Circuit concluded that the interests of justice here required that the case against Chiquita be transferred to New Jersey where personal jurisdiction was proper rather than dismissed outright in Delaware. Now the third and final main issue considered in the Chavez case was one of res judicata, an ever-present concern in class action and mass tort litigation. Um, and specifically the question here was uh, the Louisiana court eventually dismissed the case on the grounds of the statute of limitations and the question was did that bar the relitigation of these same claims in Delaware and that question is governed by a very difficult Supreme Court case called Semtech International, which if you had Professor Light for Civil Procedure, you might have actually read it. Um, I did not assign it to my Civil Procedure class, but um, one of the rules in that case was that the claim preclusive effect of a dismissal that is issued by a federal diversity court depends on the substantive law of the state where the federal diversity court sits. So remember, the Louisiana case was brought in federal district court, and it was a diversity case based on state law. So um, when that court dismissed the case for uh, untimeliness, for, have, for the statute of limitations having run, um, the Third Circuit was instructed by Semtech to look at Louisiana's law of claim preclusion of res judicata to see what the preclusive effect of that dismissal would be. And it found uh, that Louisiana actually has a statute governing res judicata, which uh, to my knowledge is somewhat unusual. Usually res judicata is a matter of case law. But the statute said a judgment does not bar another action by the plaintiff when exceptional circumstances justify relief from the res judicata effect of the judgment. And courts considering whether to apply this exception exercise their equitable discretion to balance the principle of res judicata with the interests of justice. And in doing so, the Third Circuit reviewed the entire Byzantine history of this case, starting in, was it 1993 at this point, um, and said, the plaintiffs here have vigorously pursued their claims only to be met at every moment with procedural hurdles. And the Third Circuit concluded that we believe that a Louisiana court faced with these facts would conclude that the Byzantine procedural history of this case merits an exception to Louisiana's normal rules of claim preclusion. And in concluding, the court said, for over two decades, the plaintiffs have been knocking on courthouse doors all over the country, and indeed the world, only for those doors to remain closed. The Delaware District Court concluded that, pursuant to the first filed rule, its doors must remain shut as well. That conclusion was in error. Neither the first filed rule nor Louisiana's doctrine of res judicata is fatal to the plaintiff's Delaware claims. 
We revive this litigation now, more than two decades after it began, while expressing our sincerest hope that it proceeds with more alacrity than it has to the present date. So again, this was just published last month. Um, so these cases are still alive in Delaware, at least as far as I know. And that brings us to the end of this makeup video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you soon.